everybody video here for you today now i'm working on a couple longer videos i hope to have up by the weekend just haven't had a lot of time for youtube in the past few days but i had a couple messages from people in vermont have you ever covered ancient history in vermont i have a couple videos of milton mystery mound and the mystery of vermont stone chambers done almost five years ago i believe and that was the first time i looked at ancient american mysteries then I started a new Ancient America series about a year and a half ago, and I'm still going. But I found a good site to talk about in Vermont. And when I don't have a lot of time, I know some of my longtime viewers know I like to share uh, videos from other channels. I've probably done this about two dozen times in my Ancient America series, but we are going down to the Jackson Gore Inn today in Vermont. About 13, 14 years ago, they're going to do an expansion project here at Jackson Gore Inn at Okemo Mountain Resort. They called in archeologists and they explored this area. I believe right down in this area here, significant finds were made. Some of the artifacts went back about 12,000 years. During my Ancient America series, I have probably included clips from different channels, probably about two dozen times. And today is one of those times. It just allows me to share more information when other people can do the talking. So we are gonna hear from the archeologists who did the research down here in 2007. I'm going to share about nine or 10 minutes from this almost 20 minute video here done with the University of Vermont consulting archaeology program at the base of Ludlow Mountain here, the site I've been showing you. I just thought this was interesting, fits perfectly in with my channel and the videos. And of course, some of the things that were said brought up some questions, as all videos do. So if anything rings questionable to you leave it in the comment section but i just thought this was very good archaeology here i liked what these guys said and shared so i'll share the video today at least half of it here and i will leave the full link below here you go but 11 years ago we were hired by the akimo mountain resort to survey an area that was proposed for development uh, for their their then new jackson gore um, mountain and part of that included some base lodge and parking areas and other facilities down sort of at the base of the mountain uh, and in the course of that identified a highly significant paleo-indian site on the property along with other historic resources uh, including um, colonial era and and uh, early euro-american sites associated with a toll road that went went through the same property so the area around the the ski area has been um, inhabited for you know more than 11,000 years. I don't know that the Paleo Indians were, were skiing, but they were certainly up there in the, in the mountains at that time. And it was one of those sites that allows us to see how diverse the habitat of these people was during that, during that time, a long, long time ago. We're here at the Jackson Gore uh, development, part of the larger Akimo Mountain Resort. This site number is VTWN289. The VT obviously refers to Vermont. The WN refers to Windsor County. Um, and 289 means that it's the 289th site that's been found in this county. So in um, like Chittenden and Addison counties up north, we have over a thousand site numbers. And in some of the smaller counties, we're still in the hundreds here. We identified um, a, a, a distinctive spear point that archeologists uh, countrywide recognized as belonging to the Paleo-Indian period. Because of the identification of, of really distinctive raw materials and, and tools, um, we identified this site as archeologically significant, potentially eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. The, the Paleo-Indians in general are notable, like I said, for distinctive um, uh, tools. They made a, a particular type of spear point um, that has a central groove running up the middle of both faces. And conversely, uh, to what some might think of as the older you are, the more primitive you are, Paleo-Indians are really notable for, for um, at least in stone, being some of the finest stone craftsmen uh, ever to kind of uh, utilize the material. This, the area that we're standing on, has been plowed, but other than that, it's probably been little changed for the last 11,000 years. Here we are 11 years later. Um, I'm now the state archeologist and um, John and I have uh, worked in the 
intervening years, and actually a little bit before that as well, to, to do a lot of research on Paleo Indians, to publish along with our colleague Weatherby Dorsho from the University of New Mexico, a number of papers, book chapters um, about Paleo Indian sites and how they settled across the landscape, how they moved across the landscape, and, and the findings at Jackson Gore really are important in the overall mix of what we've been able to say over the last 11 years. One of the things that's very characteristic of the earliest Paleo Indian um, artifacts is their manufacturing technique. And one of the things that changed over time for Native people was how they hafted or tied their projectile points or spear points onto, a, onto an atlatl or a spear throwing dart or later onto an arrow shaft. And the point never changed because that was always a necessary part of the weapon, weapon system. But what did change was how they tied it on. And, and during their Paleo-Indian period, we have a distinctive, what's called uh, a fluted point, a channel flake taken off up the, up the center of the artifact to basically thin it so it would fit nicely into a, into a spear shaft dart. And that, that technique and that style was the same whether you're in Washington State, in California, all the way over to the East Coast for this early migration of people into, the, into what's now North America. And it shows us that those people were connected socially during that time. And so we're digging in a very sandy context there. There are some natural stones, mostly rounded pebbles. Um, but some of the materials that Native people used are very glassy. They, they work well to make a sharp edge for a stone tool. So those are the materials that really catch the eye of the archaeologist either while excavating or screening. And this is a very tedious process. It takes a really long time because we're being so careful. But these, these things pop right out um, when you know what you're looking for, I guess. And this, was, this piece was found right in place, which is really exciting. And this is the one that has this, has this fluted point channel, channel flake going right up the middle of it. Um, kind of doesn't have any of these flake scars that are on the outside. It's been it's been intentionally um, sort of grooved in that way. Was there any trade material here? And we found some evidence of that, potentially as far away as Munsungan Lake in northern Maine, materials coming in, and also material right from the Champlain Basin up, up in the, um, at the site. So it shows you a little bit about the social networks um, of the people and also their travel um, patterns. You can see that this is a more typical Paleo-Indian assemblage. And typical is sort of a, uh, used cautiously because Paleo-Indian sites by their very nature are extremely rare. But of those in the Northeast, you know, um, sort of large end scrapers, larger side scrapers, typical fluted points, this one made out of local quartzite. These others made from materials in the Hudson Valley. The red is from uh, Monsungan Lake in Northern Maine. This yellow is all the way from uh, central Pennsylvania. Getting back to Jackson Gore, what we saw is really, really the same materials by and large, and it appears that they didn't have a lot of access to this important um, glassy stone material. And so they were using every little bit that they could to make sort of flake cutting edges and to make these fluted points, which nevertheless characteristic are quite small. Um, they're using a variety of techniques to try to get the shape with the minimum amount of material available. Um, so it was really interesting in that way. And also its location corresponded to this sort of movement uh, between, you know, a corridor between the Connecticut River Valley and the Champlain Basin, suggesting that not only were they likely hunting in this corridor, but they were probably moving from one resource area to another. And we sort of caught them in the midst of this journey where supplies were short. Up in this region, we typically think that the, the predominant prey species was caribou. Out in the Great Plains, it was bison, both extinct and modern varieties. Um, but, um, you know, John, you were saying that the Mount Holly Mammoth was found uh, nearby. So there is, there, there um, are remains of a mammoth known from uh, Ludlow, the Mount Holly Mammoth. And although there's no association at all with this site, it is in the region and it's one of the few uh, specimens known in Vermont of this now extinct megafauna. We have evidence from across North America of Paleo-Indians hunting these large animals. At one time it was thought that that was all they did, but now we recognize it was probably pretty rare um, for, 
for hunters, but they, they clearly were hunting them and particularly probably towards the end before the mammoths themselves became extinct. There's, there in some areas they became um, smaller, almost pygmy in size. And um, it's possible that they were up there hunting mammoths. It's, it's, it's one of those things that we have to speculate about because we just don't have the preservation. We just don't have the food remains Whereas a site that's only 500 or 1,000 years old, we might find food bone and be able to tell you exactly what they were hunting. Part of that movement um, and what we've really been um, looking at in the past decade or so is how the Champlain Sea played into Paleo-Indian lifeways in this region. And for those that aren't aware, about 13,000 years ago, uh, glacial ice melted north of the Gulf of St. Lawrence a glacial lake that was impounded in uh, the Champlain Basin ran out. And then because the level of the Champlain Valley um, was depressed ice, it was below sea level and seawater ran in. And for the next 3000 years or so, Champlain Sea was an arm of the Atlantic Ocean. So it contained whales and seals and narwhals and wal walruses. And uh, we spent a good deal of effort and time mapping what the Champlain Sea would have you know, looked like where, how high it went at its maximum. And we've, you know, found a lot of interesting things around that, um, that it was probably not only used as a resource base, it makes a lot of logical sense, but that it was probably also used as a transportation corridor, either using boats to go up around and then to these areas like Northern Maine, rather than going through the greens and the whites and the hill and range country, um, you know, difficult uh, traversing to use water bodies and potentially watercraft to get to these areas much easily and, and uh, more quickly. So that is a video coming from Vermont, the findings they made down here in 2007. The Inn agreed not to do the expansion project over this site of historical significance. So that's refreshing. That is a site in Vermont today, Ski Hill, evidence of human habitation going back 12,000 years. That is worth including in my Ancient America series. For, I almost said series. That would have been funny. But I hope you thought that was interesting. And you all have a very nice day.